is episode 18 of the Improv London podcast with this week's guest, Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse. This ain't gonna be easy. Some boys moving around. Welcome to episode 18. I'm your host, Stuart Moses. And this week I had the very great pleasure to speak to Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse. There are many, many interesting things about... Uh, Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse, and uh, one of those is his work as an improviser off stage, as well as his improvisation on stage, and uh, that gives him a, a different perspective from maybe the people we've spoken to so far. So, I uh, very much enjoyed exploring that side of things, and uh, we also hear we also hear about what he would like the uh, future of the uh, London improv scene to hold. I Welcome, Jonathan <laughs> Hello. Hello. Funkhouse, Monkhouse, That's me. to the podcast. Uh, thanks very much, thanks for having me. How, how do you prefer to be addressed? Uh, uh, that, the full... The, the full Jonathan the full, Funkhouse, yeah. Yeah, Monkhouse. Yeah. All those syllables. All those yeah. syllables yeah. throughout, so that, that is how I would address you yeah. throughout right. the Thank podcast. Thank you very much, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, John's fine. John's fine, okay. John's also fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see how it, we'll see how it goes. If my name comes up, we might not. It's just there's just two of us here. Um, so if you're trying to attract the attention of any particular person, uh, is that... uh, that isn't me, uh, the, then um, do you find your names often used for that? Like, was, hey, I saw a fact recently. Uh, saw a fact recently that there was it was something in the, like in the 16th century or something about. Something crazy like thirty-five percent of British men were called John. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can it believe was, that. It's like such a common name. Oh well, if there was any, if there's any way of making me less interesting, uh, <laughs> it's by giving me the same name as a third of our nation, or a third of the males of our nation. Maybe it's women as well. I don't know. <laughs> Might have been a female name in the olden days. Who this uh, this podcast isn't about facts. The listeners, they can look up. They can look up facts themselves. Yeah, that's We're here about yeah. opinions yeah. and things yeah. that, that we think. <laughs> now, um, in the past, I've done a lot of uh, interviews with uh, bands, and yeah. one of the unwritten rules of interviewing bands is you never ask how they got their name. Oh, okay. I'm going to break that rule. Oh, really? You're going to ask me how I'm called John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my parents' decision. Yeah. Uh, Did they yeah. think long and hard about it? I don't know. I, I, all I know is that if I was a girl, I was going to be called Christina, um, which is my sister's name, and that's a name that my dad... Uh, there was a woman on TV, a character on TV called Christina that my dad fancied. Really? So, uh, so which I find a little bit odd. So yeah. my sister is named after a woman that my dad fancied off the telly. Yeah, now you mention that, that does seem... It's a bit strange, but I, I jumped that bullet. Jumped the bullet. I jumped that train. Good. And landed on a bullet. Wow. And that bullet had John written on it. And that... <laughs> You had a bullet with your name on it. <laughs> yeah. Right, instead of killing you, it named you. It named me. It's something amazingly poetic. It's like I'm in a Wild West film. <laughs> cool. I have um, I have done research. <laughs> That's frightening. I don't want I don't want really to mention it because how deep has he gone? Not that deep. Okay. Uh, but I don't really want to say that because then there may be other people I interview and I haven't done any research oh yeah yeah. so um, you know yeah. but I um, just to explain that I have a piece of paper and if it's the right piece of paper it will have a few things great that I uh, if it's the wrong piece of paper that's also exciting well that's very nice you can of you to say you'd be like oh so in 1984 <laughs> you were elected president of the United States of America wrong wrong Jonathan wrong, Funkhouse wrong, Monkhouse wrong one, wrong one there are so many in history yeah. do you ever get confused with <laughs> Look, there we are. There we go. There we are, Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse. Amazing. I'm not going to look at those questions, so no. they surprise me. Okay. Well, I will start with a, a brief story. <laughs> okay. Is it a story about where we are? <laughs> oh, yeah, we should do the who, what, where. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, who? Who? Uh, John. John Stewart. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. Hi, John. We are... <laughs> We are outside at the Miller. We are at the Miller. Because we thought this would be the optimal audio recording sister system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should, should, but just, just to put it into full context, we're on a sofa outside the front of the Miller because that's the quietest place. 
But it's not about the the volume. It's about this being one of the epicenters of improv in the UK, right? Yes, that's, that's the right. reason. That's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> yeah. You're a man that's that can do technical things, and I admire that. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. Finally, it's a recognition. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yes, that's true. In particular, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about uh, the the doing the tech because I believe that is that the phrase you use in the business. I'm doing the tech for a show. I am working on a better phrase, but at the moment that's the one that I use. Right. What, what, um, what have you got for better phrases? So I far? don't know. I feel specifically with improv. I think um, uh, I like the I like the uh, technical improviser. Right. As a, yes. as a yes. title, but it's a bit clumsy. It doesn't all work because I'll, I'll be writing to an, an email to someone and I'll be like. Um, te- I'm, I'm technically improvising, <laughs> uh, really, which, which is sort of yeah. a double meaning. Uh, one of which is sort of a bit snide, and um, <laughs> I'm technically improvising. Uh, uh, but yeah, but what I mean to say is I'm technically improvising. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, I, I do the tech for a bunch of stuff. Um, because I, t- I took my first step into the world of uh, being a technical improviser. Last yes, night. I saw that. Congratulations! Thank Welcome to much. the club. It was. I really, really enjoyed it. I mean, you know, I wasn't doing a lot. You yeah. Know. Uh, I was. It was the um, the Hoopla Advanced Long Form Improv Showcase. A catchy that. title. Um, <laughs> and um, and I just thought, oh, I'd really like to just know what it's like to be behind the desk. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I was mainly. Uh, uh, many uh, there was one slider. Do you call them sliders? Uh, f- I depend. Yeah, f- sliders works. I, us- I usually call them faders. Faders. Um, no, I like faders. I'm going to call it faders. Yeah. So there was one fader yeah. uh, for the volume of the uh, MP3 player. Correct. That yes, in. that would work. And yeah. then I had another fader yeah. for the lights to yep. go brighter and dimmer. Yes. So uh, that went pretty well. <laughs> Great. Well done. <laughs> Well, that is, that's the step. That's the first step. That's two faders. <laughs> next, next time, have four faders, what, what, and then what do the other two do? Oh well, um, <laughs> I mean, they can do all sorts of things. One could be a microphone. One Ooh. could be the color blue. Wow. One could be a smoke machine. Wow. <laughs> I feel like I've blown your mind. That's more, amazing. It's more, than, it's more than just on and off. It's quite amazing just doing on and off, to be honest. <laughs> It'd be amazing if I'd made a career out of just turning stuff on and off. <laughs> like, a, like a gas man. Well, yeah. I'm here to turn it on again. All right. I mean, there was there was a sign, there is a sign on the, the uh, desk. Yeah. Do we call it the desk? Uh, yes. Call yeah. it the desk. Yeah. And the Miller, which says, do not switch this on or off unless you're a member of the Miller staff. Yeah. That's fair enough. It's delicate equipment and yeah. it's expensive. So yeah. I couldn't actually have turned it off even if I'd wanted to. So the ability <laughs> to turn these things on and off is not to be, you know... Wow, it's a super dark art. Well, uh, it was dark <laughs> in a very literal... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a darkening art. <laughs> uh, and a lightening art. And it's uh, about getting those in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, different colour lights had not even occurred to me. That's, yeah. uh, I'm on the first step of the journey. That's 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 how I'm able to make a career to, yeah. uh, of it. People don't even imagine that there could be a red light somewhere. Wow. Yeah, and I'd switch one on and it blows people's minds. I'm just hearing about Wide it. My open. mind is blown. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let, yeah. uh, let's talk about uh, the music, which I think is probably the smaller side of things than the lights. But Sure, um, yeah. I was I was ill prepared. Right. I um, all my life I've wanted to inflict uh, music. I mean, play people yeah. music. No, it is is it is inflicting. That's what we call it in the business. Oh, is that? Yeah, that's yeah, the you inflict term. music. Yeah. Um, because uh, Katie said, "Oh, you know, you can if you know, have got some music." I said, "Yes, I've got some music," and I just thought, "This this is inappropriate. Uh-huh. This is this is not going to get everyone in the party mood." Yeah. This is my podcast. Yeah. Oh, I wonder. <laughs> No, not <laughs> not not really the first, subtle advertising. Not not on my first gig. No, I'm not going to no. start playing the podcast. Fair enough. The, uh, yeah, I was I was once doing a. Uh, I do corporate tech. That's where I. Uh, that's why I can afford to eat. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was once on a job that was in a. It was in a secondary school, and it was it was it was some charity thing, some big charity event, and uh, and I was setting up and I, uh, I was doing sound for that event, and. Um, and I just had a sort of random playlist playing while we were setting up, 
Uh, now there's a there's a there's a live show that you may or may not have seen or heard of uh, called Dirty Fan Mail. Right. No, uh, I which not. is uh, it's 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 an, it's an incredible thing. The guys brought out a CD. Um, and it's uh, this guy whose sister was a page three model, right? Uh, and she started. She got she got lots of fan mail from um, very from fans of varying levels of misogyny. Uh. Um, and she used to give her fan mail to her brother, and this guy turned it into a show, which was the show was just reading out fan, this disgusting wow. fan mail uh, in various different uh, uh, genres and with musical styles and stuff. Nice. Uh, now, so I was at this event. I was setting up for this event at a secondary school, <laughs> and um, and let, let's just say, uh, uh, even on even on the level of dirty fan mail, this was in, inappropriate. Uh, I started belting out of the PA, and I was on the other side of a, a, an enormous school hall. Uh, you so, running across the room, going, "No!" Yeah, so it was it was it was like a sentence and a half of quite foul, uh, <laughs> revolting stuff. Uh, before I managed to get to the fader and uh, and mute the hell out of it, but um, I I don't think anyone really. It, luckily, there weren't many people because we were still setting up. But yes. it was a it was a eye opening moment. <laughs> I thought, oh well, I'm going to be fired now, so that's great. <laughs> mm. So do you have um, do you have a music always with you that yeah. you just like? So is it a bit like being because it's not there's no dance floor. So you don't have to keep people dancing. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, uh, what are you? What are you trying to do? What's your? What's your go-to? What's your wham? What's your abba? <laughs> is it wham and abba? Um, I I I don't have one actually. I sort of have a challenge, and this is this is a personal challenge, which uh, is only ever noticed by very few people. Especially if I'm taking a short form short uh, show. Um, or maybe if I end up taking theatre sports, although an amazing technician called Tom Bacon is currently taking theatre sports. Uh, I love him, and uh, I, I, if he gets ill, then I will gladly do it, but, um, but he's amazing. Um, I, I, the thing I like to do is, find during a scene, I will find the track that's relevant to the scene Ooh. to play when I take the lights out. Nice, yeah. Um, which is noticed by... Uh, a, a fraction of a few people that is, that is but occasionally that's... it's noticed and, uh, and, uh, and you might get a little round of applause or something or someone after the show will go oh, it was really cool when you played um, there was a scene about lizards and then you played everyone walk the dinosaur afterwards <laughs> I noticed and I'd be like yeah I'm gonna that's amazing I'm gonna go home and have a little thankful cry my, my, um, my work here is done yeah, yeah. So that's what I like to do. I, I do have a couple of playlists and stuff, but it depends on the show. Like if I'm if I'm taking a big party show, like a short form thing, it's just all cheesy disco. Right. Yeah. I'm really into Taylor Swift at the moment. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which I've just admitted on a podcast. <laughs> no, I'm proud of it. Uh, just anything like that. Um, just I can tag her when uh, I tweet. Yeah. About so, that so, so, <laughs> so yeah, just make sure that get Taylor Swift, Swift gets, fans on she's, board. She's 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 just. She's running out of fans, I think. She's probably think dipped so. below about twenty or thirty million right, okay. uh, fans and on you're Twitter. You're thinking my so. podcast might just yeah. I think if she, could, no, right if she could just give her another couple of hundred. If Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse uh, likes her, then yeah. Uh, then, I, then United <laughs> Improv People of London will unite behind you. John, John Monkhouse endorses Taylor Swift. Yeah. You're welcome, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> So um, yeah. <laughs> so if but that, that so if that's if you're soundtracking a short form show, but if you were doing yeah. something long form, is that when you bust out the? Uh... Um, it totally depends. I really like creating playlists for certain shows. So we do. So Project Two, who's my main group, we do a monthly show called Geek Easy, and every every Geek Easy has a theme, and part of my job before. Um, before the night is to make a playlist of relevant music for that theme cool. so recently we had a Wild West one so the entire playlist was um, sort of old Ennio Morricone nice. uh, uh, sort of western soundtracks we've had um, we did one last uh, late last year which is about uh, children's TV so the entire playlist was all children's TV theme tunes that kind of thing so I really like I, I really like collecting music that's relevant to the show that I'm doing yes. and if, if, if it was a, a genre show like uh, like the nursery are doing now um, or uh, 
you know, my, my main inspiration is Parallelogram, a phonograph, the guys at the hideout in Austin. Uh, shout out to those guys if you're listening. <laughs> uh, they probably are because they've become a fan since uh, uh, Journeyman Mark Tingle. Uh, <laughs> there you go, Mark, you're in. Um, if, uh, <laughs> because he's such an ambassador for us now in Austin. Um, uh, yeah, so the stuff that they do, like they have really genre specific shows, and I really like making a playlist. It's, it's all part of the theatre as far as I'm concerned. Of, uh, of walking into a venue and, and ev- everything from the moment you walk through the door uh, it, it's possible to make that support the show that's about to happen Yes, I'm really interested in that sort of production side of yeah. things of just you know, of, of that little bit that's kind of why I wanted to do it last night because I wanted to just even have the idea of what can we do that's just going to make this feel a little bit more magical, a little bit more special Yeah, yeah and I love that. I, I, you know, I, I come from a sort of quite theatrical background as well, um, and and working on like I, uh, teching for sketch shows and stuff. That's really become part of it as well. Like yeah. um, uh, uh, specifically, uh, Massive Dad when I was teching for their show last year, um, they had this kind of underlying Tron theme uh, throughout the entire. Sk- it's a sketch show, but it had it was kind of held together by this sort of loose Tron electro theme type stuff so all the music all, you know as much as possible the um, between music of the sketches and stuff all became like Daft Punk Tron <laughs> uh, like electro like big and, and, and to create the party atmosphere as well <laughs> yeah because um, it's all big beats and you know really really you know gets people into it and excited and yeah I, I, I love that I love I love if finding all of the ways that you can support the show yeah um, uh, with, with technical stuff as well yeah yeah um, one of the interesting things I found from last night, it was coming back to that technical improviser idea. Yeah. It was just, can I just have something that can fade everything to black in all situations when someone says something really funny? Because once you've done that, <laughs> once you've done that for a stage, it's really quite addictive. Yeah. And you think, I mean, I wasn't doing many edits last night. As basically, yeah. it was the you know we were doing um, the living room. And, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's basically after about twenty minutes, I'm yeah. waiting for the big laugh just to fade it out. At the yeah. End. So, uh, which was perfect for my first time. But it was like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I was engaging with the show in a different way. Yeah. From being on stage as part of the action, or even being part of the audience. It yes. was a weird middle ground. That yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, it kind of is because you're not you're not always second guess like you're not. Uh, when you're on stage you're sometimes second guessing or you're trying to see ahead um, and, and obviously you are providing the material as well uh, and that's less of a job when you're doing the tech although I'm sort of pushing for it to be more a job of yeah. the technician as well I think that be- because you can if you're in a, in a well equipped theatre that's got good lighting like uh, doing showstoppers we were always in big theatres we had a really big lighting rig um, with loads and loads of options um, so you're, you're when you've got that available to you. Oh, and when I'm doing ostentatious, um, I'm sure we were going to go into that at some point. Um, if, if you're in, if you're in a big venue and you've got lots of different lights and effects and stuff that you can use, you can actually make offers to the people on stage as well. And uh, if, I'm, I'm, so, I'm I really like the relationship between on stage and off stage improvisers working together. I'm, yeah. I'm, and a show I'm working on with uh, Jonah Fazel. Yes. Um, uh, we're, we're looking, we're investigating that relationship so that one thing is feeding the other, and that, and that it's like it, it's, it's a dialogue between off stage and on stage improvisers. Yeah, m- more um, than it necessary, you know, has been in in the past. That's um, really exciting to me. Yeah, I was, and I was thinking along those lines. Um, Alistair from City Improv. Yeah, uh, City, City Impro. Mm. Um, he said something about I can't remember who he was performing with now, but he said, oh why don't you sing a song about that or something like that right. and I'd have loved to have had some music just to have come in and I yeah, just yeah. you know or had some beats if someone was going to rap or you know yeah. it was beyond so, me from the first time but I was so like, I do have you know Spotify is an amazing thing but also a massive iTunes library but it's you know I, I do have a playlist that is just backing beats yeah so if so if uh, if there's not if someone doesn't leap to a microphone and start doing that amazing white person beatbox that, that, that improv is uh, world famous for um, uh, if someone if someone doesn't do that then I do have this this is so yeah so it's as a, as a I think a good tech backs up the improvisers yeah. 
and makes them um, uh, and their job is to make them look amazing yes um, and just do that from the back of the room in this kind of like hidden little area with a you know some a couple of computers and a couple of uh, varying desks and that sort of thing yeah because um, the, the nearest yeah. thing got to that there was a moment where uh, someone said something about there was a, this whole thing about um, light being in people's eyes uh-huh. and I'd realised I hadn't actually put up the lights quite as much as I perhaps should have so uh-huh. I was like very slowly just moving it up yeah yeah and then they said something I can't remember they said something and I reacted by kind of flickering the lights or something like that yeah um, it was like I thought well, I'm you know there's so much more I can do but this kind of feels like you know yeah yeah when you when you, I mean I am I'm by far not the most uh, dexterous lighting improviser out there um, I would say uh, there's uh, Damien Robinson is uh, Rob Damien Robertson, sorry, that car was interrupting me. Um, Damien Robertson is a phenomenal lighting improviser. He is, he's, he's absolutely more technically um, uh, adept than I am, um, and and is quicker at running like more complicated lighting desks yeah. um, than I can do. Uh, uh, yes, I, <laughs> I think basically what I'm looking for is a is a mind controlled uh, AV system. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think that's, so that's, that's so that if I think of something, then uh, <laughs> then the music plays, the lights go to that, and then and also uh, it immediately downloads a suitable video from YouTube and plays that on a massive screen. Nice, yeah. Uh, that would be, that would be the perfect. I mean, uh, I would, would be the perfect. I, I so I so that so I I can react as a technician as quickly as uh, an onstage improviser can react yes. with, with with their mouth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That that would be ideal. I think <laughs> um, we're a way off that. I mean, I, you know, they've already done it with the fighter jets and. Uh, yeah, they're working. I mean, it's maybe it's not so far off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think they've got their priorities wrong because yeah. I think <laughs> they know, be. lighting desks yeah. are much better for humankind than fighter jets. They, yeah. Oh yeah. Light, light, I mean, I light completely not agree with that. Lights not fight. Lights not fight. And sounds, face black. <laughs> so, sounds not rounds of exactly. ammunition. Yes. Yeah, nice. Uh, <laughs> that would be like that's such a specific uh, uh, kind of charity campaign. <laughs> Lights, not fights. <laughs> we would people <laughs> let's people in the performing industry against war, <laughs> but specifically improv. Yes, <laughs> the, the tens of us getting together. Once uh, we've once we've got Taylor Swift back on track. Then we'll take on war. Yeah, yeah. In that order, she might even help us out. You know, yeah, she's, she's you got scratch it. my back, Taylor. I will. Uh, you know, I'll help you out. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll help you out. That's, <laughs> that's how the phrase goes. I think. I think. You know. Yeah. I think that's that's that sounds a very reasonable <laughs> offer. And if Miss Miss Swift uh, declines to respond, well, that's that reflects poorly on her. Yeah. Oh, but she. The the problem is if we ever fall out you know if the improv community ever falls out with Taylor um, she's going to write a song about it uh, well, you know which could go I'm either happy, way really I'm happy with that yeah and that's I think true that, yeah, that yeah. advertising of uh, I think no, she, <laughs> she what were the words no sorry that was a really, that's she, a really she terrible can, she can redo the she, I like to improvise <laughs> she can redo she can redo the theme to this podcast uh, <laughs> Well, I don't like to improvise. Oh in no, London. no, not anymore because we fell out. <laughs> uh, oh, Taylor, come back to us, Taylor. She hasn't gone. She okay, hasn't, she's yeah. only gone in your imagination. Oh, that's true. Yeah, she's still with us. Okay, oh, I'll hang on to that. <laughs> she's not actually with us. With us? But no, no, no. She, but she could be. She could be. Yeah, she hasn't. Uh, she hasn't said that she hates us. <laughs> uh, um. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, sound and light. Oh yeah, Amazing. we covered. We did. Uh, we did a lot of sound. Actually, as a technician, sound is actually quite a small uh, part of it. Unless, uh, like, uh, the most complicated one was uh, Showstoppers because that had a live band and uh, you know six or seven people singing. Um, that that was fairly complicated, but um, but uh, but generally, sound is sound so far has been quite a small part of yeah. um, of improv. Um, yeah, and the, the show I'm jo- doing with Jonah is, is called, will be called Wired, uh, with an amazing cast, um, um, uh, and that will be looking at that and seeing how we can make it bigger. Yeah, oh, we, oh, we have talked about lighting as well. 
a little bit. Yeah, lighting's way more important currently in uh, improv. Yeah, um, because it is it's it's helping with the wear. Yes. If you know if if people are in a cave, you make oh. the lights blue. Yes. Standard guys. <laughs> well, I, I was just uh, thinking I'm going to make the lights dim, but putting them on blue—that's uh, blue. Yeah, that's it's nice. This, this comes from a kind of the theatrical background that I have, and like if, you, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if sort of uh, a, a layman goes to a, a sort of non-techie person goes to see theatre and notices the tech, or, or if it, if if it's doing the if it's doing the best job, it's yes. like a film soundtrack. You, you don't, don't notice it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just experience the feeling that it yes. gives you. And I think that yeah, like a soundtrack, the lighting should really be the same. Um, uh, it's just supporting what's happening and and sort of emphasising it making it more theatrical um, so yeah maybe I, I don't know maybe people don't notice it uh, as much I, when I walk into a theatre the first thing I look at is the lighting rig yeah uh, or any, any tech if there are screens or anything like that and I'd start sort of working out what's about to happen <laughs> uh, that's just because I'm a nerd um, uh, yeah so that's so, that, so that's it it's about supporting what's happening on stage that that, that's the thing that the audience is looking at so you just help that out as much as possible um, yeah so, so you mentioned with uh, showstoppers this was a very specific um, technical set of requirements yeah what, what was it like working with showstoppers uh, it was really good fun they are they are so driven to making this um, uh, this incredible show and they've obviously su- succeeded yes because um, they've they've had this uh, I, I Kind of sadly, and it's due to um, time constraints and being too busy doing other things. But I haven't, I haven't really done showstoppers in about two or more years now. Um, but it was really, it was just really nice to be on a like going to proper theatres with uh, this sort of well-recognised show that was improv. Yes. Um, it, that, and and I'm so pleased that they got these the, kind of what's now like. They, they have, they've had sort of uh, a one and a half. I think they're halfway through the second one. Um, West End runs. That's like it's 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 credible theatre now, yes. or, or understood by outsiders to be credible theatre. And they've been nominated for an Olivier Award now, or or maybe even more than one. Uh, and I just think that's like when if you work that hard, that, then you do deserve to get that. I think. Yes. Um, and it's and it's nice that it's been recognised by mainstream theatre practitioners and press and stuff um, outs- outside of Edinburgh because Ed- like they, they, they got a really good following in Edinburgh but Edinburgh's this weird bubble of, um, of kind of theatre and improv and, and comedy and, and so it's, it's, it's its own world and it sort of doesn't count to the outside world although it can make famous people out of it but um, yeah no uh, Showstoppers is great it's, a, it's I think it's a really important show in like the history of British uh, improvisation, um, when when books get written about how how our how uh, yeah how our scene happened, then they will be, you know they 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 they'll, they'll probably they'll, they should have a chapter. Yeah, um, I think yeah, uh, them, them and ostentatious I think. So when you're teching for showstoppers or ostentatious, yeah. Um, this is um, there's an ongoing narrative it's kind of it's it's a, what I'm trying to think about is how so when a scene changes or when a song ends yeah and they're moving to the next thing yeah how from your position are you reinforcing that or making offers are you listening to the music or I don't know. Just I'm interested to know. Do you know where they're going to go next? Um, do you have an idea? Not not any more than an, any of the onstage improvisers, yeah. really. Um, I mean, Austin and um, Showstoppers are really different shows. Um, a, a lot of Showstoppers scenes will finish on a song, yeah. um, which Austin doesn't have. Uh, Austin is a is a very free form format. Um, Showstoppers is, is 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 free form in that it, it's not it's not got it's not like a Harold it's not a, a planned out thing beforehand but it does 
but it does have elements like songs yeah. um, that are kind of uh, usually seen enders. Um, I think uh, basically I'm an because I'm an improviser because I'm an on-stage improviser. I see doing the tech as just being an improviser. Right. So I'm I'm reading the end of scenes, sometimes calling the end of scenes, uh, sometimes reacting to what's going on stage, just as much as any of the on-stage improvisers are doing. Yeah. Um, and and th- uh, thankfully I have experience doing both, uh, so I think that's helpful. Um, in making me better at supporting the show as a technician. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So yeah. So there's, so there's not like, yeah. There's not. There's there's no knowledge that a scene's ended. Yeah. Uh, regardless of the format or company, but there's but there's the ability to read uh, what's happening on stage and react to it. And and being an improviser, is, makes me less fearful of that. When I when I would do when I do corporate work, yeah. It's it's really strange to me because the corporate. Uh, live events and things they they want everything nailed down to the exact second sometimes yeah. and they don't understand that some, sometimes my response to it, sometimes my response to um, uh, to pre-planning is, is oh I'll just react to what's happening on stage yeah. and that terrifies some people because yeah. they're like no but we've got a script down to the minute yeah, 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 <laughs> like yeah yeah, I'd pro- yeah I'll, I mean I'll have it in front of me yeah, but yeah, yeah. mainly like that can change that's you've written a script and then the show is going to happen in in you know it's starting in an hour what if someone doesn't make it to the stage what if someone trips up what like yeah. I, I mean these, I mean those those, me are, those, those are disasters yeah. but like this this script is sort of irrelevant it's not going to take exactly 30 seconds to some for someone collect you know if it's an award ceremony it's not going to take 30 seconds for someone to walk from the back of the room uh, to the stage to get their photo taken, it's going to take 18 seconds or 49 seconds. <laughs> so there's like, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. So that terrifies corporate people, but it keeps corporate stuff interesting for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. cool. So let's uh, let's uh, travel back in time. Cool. <laughs> Using our minds. Okay. <laughs> Done. It's 1994. What happened in 1994? Uh, what did happen in 1994? Uh, I, w- I would have been at home watching Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf? <laughs> I imagine. Red Dwarf. Did you not find that depressing? Red Dwarf? Yes. No, Red Dwarf is amazing. Not even the first season. The no. These people trapped in this... They're the last people in the world and they just irritate each other and it's like, is that not hell? Um, I, I mean, suppose I'm the not ir- saying I'm such. The but. irritating thing, yeah, but like that's sort of my dream. I imagine being the, one of the last four beings. That would be cool. There's a lot of rubbish beings. There is. It'd be that. great if there were less. That's that, 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 that's my <laughs> terrible Nazi. Um, we should have less people. Um, no. Oh no, I love Red Dwarf. Um, I, I sort of like that. I like that they were kind of pioneers in their own way. Uh, they were oh, the first the characters. Pe- yeah, the characters. Yeah, <laughs> Red Dwarf was great because I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of TV as a kid because my parents thought it was super offensive uh, and re- were really uh, touchy about that kind of thing. But they were perfectly happy for me to watch Red Dwarf. That's we strange. watched Red Dwarf as a family. Wow, that was a family show in my house. Despite wow. I wasn't allowed to watch uh, Doctor Who because it was too scary. I wasn't allowed to watch. Um, oh, I, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> the two, our two family shows. Uh, were Red Dwarf and Men Behaving Badly. Wow. <laughs> so, they are not suitable for nine-year-olds. No. Uh, Although when you're nine, you take different things from it that... Yeah, absolutely. You, know, yeah. you, you see it in a different way. Yeah, oh, that's true. So... Um, but, you know... Weird. Yeah. Uh, and Bottom. Bottom was the other thing. I had um, I had bad experience with uh, Red Dwarf. Just oh, I'm sorry. That's just... Did Fine. you watch it like out of order? Uh, no, not so much. Okay, so, so first of all, someone described it the first season to me as being like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, and I thought this isn't anything like Hitchhiker's Guide, Hitchhiker's mm. Guide to the Galaxy. I mean, I suppose it's more like Hitchhikers mm. than some things. But yeah, it's still yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. more like the no, yeah, yeah. If, if you have a great love of Hitchhiker's Guide, then you're waiting for towels and vo- towels and vogons, I suppose, and uh, and dolphins. <laughs> like, it's not as it's yeah, 
Yeah, no, it, yeah. So, I can see why they said it, but I also yeah. can see why it's completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, uh, oh, this is. Uh, <laughs> I've got started now, so I'll finish. Yeah. This is not. This is not going to be the highlight of uh, the interview. Um, <laughs> It was when we were talking about Taylor Swift, wasn't well, it? Well, yeah, was I think highlight. we peaked the peak then. Um, <laughs> we can find another peak! Taylor, we'll Taylor, okay. Taylor, come and save us. No, but I think it's important to have those bits which aren't as good. We're just going to push through them. I'm just going to finish saying this thing now. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you could be onto something, yeah. Well, I'm not really, because it's a very personal uh, experience of uh, Red Dwarf. But, sure. Uh, when I was at <laughs> university, I ran the Film Society. Yeah. Um, and my, fr- my friend Mark uh, would never come to any of my film showings because it was on the same night as Red Dwarf and he wanted to stay at home and watch Red Dwarf and that annoyed me no wonder me. <laughs> no wonder there's, there's like a post-traumatic stress disorder thing it just really annoyed me oh god <laughs> those well, are, neither of those are good reasons not to like Red Dwarf I do concede that well, well I don't know yeah it's, you know, it's, the, it's the emotion that it's attached to that series <laughs> Mark if you're out there like con- get in contact Say sorry, and then, this, and then Stuart can enjoy Red Dwarf it, again. It was, in, it was in a, you know, it was in times before, you know, we could record. Oh, we could record things. I don't know why he didn't record it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think he wanted to come to my film society. Meeting. Mark, forget it. Don't get in touch. You're an arsehole. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> We're travelling uh, back in time. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Perhaps move a bit forward beyond 1994 yeah. to 2001 oh oh you what happened in so 2001 <laughs> I don't mean the film because that just happens uh, very slowly as, uh, <laughs> a lot not much happens very slowly uh, do so, you like 2001 the uh, film do you know what it's not as much as I should being a sci-fi nerd um, I think it's a little self-indulgent and nowhere near as good as his other movies um, there's elements I like to it, like about it, um, but yeah, no, I don't think it's as great as everyone says. What and I've never like- listened to it with a Pink Floyd vinyl, <laughs> so uh, I don't really know. I don't really know if it's fully. Uh, I think that's part of what you have to do. Is it? Is is that right? Is it? it listen, you watch 2001 with Pink Floyd, well, I Dark think, Side of the Moon on. I think. Or is that Wizard of Oz? It's Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I was just thinking you had this rule about any film. You just like put, put <laughs> dark. You just really love Dark Side of the Moon. I can't, I can't fully enjoy any film yeah, unless, unless I it's put got Pink Dark Floyd Side of the Moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like that with Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion. Oh, uh, you know, it was uh, like that with um, the, uh, the the Transformers movies. <laughs> uh, none of them were improved by Pink Floyd. You could um, probably play Dark Side of the Moon a couple of times each time. <laughs> yeah, I mean. it's so long. Um, so two thousand. So your is your research is is was listening to the podcast that Chris did. Well, I did uh, listen to it. No, I, well, obviously <laughs> when I recorded it, I was listening to him. I mean, actually, yeah. I nipped down the pub and had a pint and came back when he was finished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Friend of the show, Chris Mead. Uh, I'm very, um, <laughs> I'm very happy. With, I'm so. Very, you, uh, two, uh, let's get back on track, Stuart. In, Come what, on. in what way was 2001 significant to your improv story, Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse? Well, um, yeah, it's quite funny because uh, my origin story is so similar to Chris's. Not just origin, but like uh, um, stuff that we've done since. Um, uh, but yeah, so 2001, I was in, in Edinburgh uh, doing a show with Chris. What was that show called? It was called The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Right, yes. Um, I remember him saying that. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. If you want details, go back and listen to the Chris Mead podcast. <laughs> uh, uh, but basically, I was in a venue in, in Edinburgh, uh, and in the same venue as us was Baby Wants Candy. Um, so I ended up seeing their show a bunch of times, uh, which involved me having my brain exploding a, f- a few times because I didn't really understand I knew I knew of whose line is it anyway at the time um, but I didn't like I never never even considered long for I never heard of it I didn't know that it was a thing uh, so I saw this show with these guys and it basically I just thought they were superhuman <laughs> I didn't like I, c- I couldn't understand that this was a skill that a normal person could learn it, it just felt like oh these these people have superpowers yes. and they can make a musical happen um, 
and also make it funny and make sense and uh, and you know make everyone in an auditorium sit for an hour and have painful uh, laughy muscles I think that's what it's called isn't <laughs> yeah, it the one in the stomach it's a laughy muscle that's a technical term yeah so they just did this amazing thing and then um, but I kind of but that, but that was it there was it was sort of saw that that was amazing and then it ended and I know Chris had an association with them uh, you know for a few years after that but I kind of this was at the time that I was at university and uh, doing a theatre course which I hated oh no um, I really, I, I really, I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid. Um, so I went to university and did theatre, and then my theatre course I did not enjoy, uh, and vowed to never go on stage again. Wow. But it did make me discover the off-stage stuff. So I ended right. up doing set design and lighting design and sound design for uh, everyone else in my year. And I'm really loving that, and that's how I got into technical stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, ve- I basically vowed never to go on stage again and didn't for seven years or something until uh, 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 Chris and Nicky Kidner dragged me to uh, it, what, what turned out to be a Hoopla improv drop-in yeah. work, uh, workshop run by Steve. Uh, Steve Rowe, uh, <laughs> at Hoopla Steve uh, on Twitter. Um, no. Is he? Is it I think, not at Hoopla Impro? Oh, maybe it's at Hoopla Impro. I'm sorry. Uh, check the notes of this podcast. Yes. To, to It'll find, be in the show notes. It will be in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so I got dragged along to that, which there's, there's, a, there's a longer story that involves breaking up with a girl and then falling in love with another girl and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I got, I, I got dragged. I can't help but think that's the more interesting story. <laughs> it probably is. Um, so I got... Uh, is, is it really painful? No, it's not painful at oh, all. So essentially, uh, <laughs> it's boring if it's not painful. Okay, it's super painful. It's like stabbing a knife in my eye. Brilliant. Um, Do uh, tell us in every detail then. <laughs> no, so I, I, I was going out with this one girl. Uh, we broke up uh, to uh, while Chris was in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Fringe. Was that the reason? Uh, so I went. I was like Chris. I phoned Chris and I was like, "Dude, I've got to get out of London." Uh, can I come and visit you in Edinburgh? So I went up there for four days. During those four days, Chris took me to a Hoopla short form show that wow. was going on. Yeah. Um, in that show, there was a girl that I was like, wait, she's hot. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to be okay. Um, uh, and, then, and then after Edinburgh, uh, went to... Uh, went to the first uh, Hoopla drop-in class and there was another girl there who uh, people who know me will know who that is and if she's listening hiya Um, uh, we get on really well now so it's fine Um, but uh, there was this other girl there who was like oh my god she's amazing Uh, and so basically I I I I I went for the girl and stayed for the impro. Nice. Uh, that's how. That's what got me into improv. I, I believe. Was, I was based. I stuck around. I went to class after class after class, hoping to impress this girl. Um, Did you impress this girl? Uh, for a while, yeah. Good. That's uh, nice. Yeah, and uh, but but then, but fell in love both with uh, the person and the art. Uh, and and uh, you know. And I'm still doing one of them. Oh, oh, that's, oh God! Oh. oh, that was that was. I mean, to be honest, you've made my talking about Red Dwarf look quite good after that comment. So I appreciate you. Uh... That was an unintentional pun. I, I don't. Really, oh. I don't really like puns. No, I don't like that one. I apologise. That was awful. I meant. Oh dear. That's thrown me. Uh, so uh, improv, yeah. So I fell in love with improv uh, in that whole process, and uh, and um, uh, and uh, and still, it's a huge part of my life, and probably will be always. Uh, although it has improv has actually weirdly improv has led me to enjoy other art and comedy forms. Really, a lot of people. I think a lot of people come into it where they are. There's definitely like a, a, a bunch of stand-ups and a bunch of uh, sketch comedians and probably a bunch of sort of more theatrical actors and stuff who are now coming into improv as a device to help them right. with their with their existing art form. Yes. For me, like I said, I was out of it for eight years, seven or eight years, um, fell in love with improv, and now that's got me into uh, uh, into the world of character sketch. Um, uh, 
and, and theatre. So I've uh, now I'm involved with you know a bunch of uh, amazing comedians and sketch artists and, uh, and theatrical people who uh, are really at, like the, the top of their game. But I've come into it from improv because yeah. that was it was it, that it, it all came through Carriad, right? Yes. Uh, the uh, the incredible Carriad Lloyd. Uh, have you uh, uh, who? Just, sorry. So I was just to say, have you listened to our interview with Richard Herring? Yes, yeah, amazing. She's such a good ambassador for improv, I think, in in the sort of the world of mainstream yes. comedy. Um, she's she's really, you know, uh, got her got a foot comfortably in those bo- in both of those places. Um, but she, but I was up in Edinburgh some some years later after my big empty uh, uh, culturalist void, um, <laughs> uh, uh, doing a. Uh, a month run in Edinburgh with uh, Music Box and I knew I was going up with Music Box and uh, I and Carrie had on Twitter had basically said oh I need a technician for my solo show that I'm doing wow. and I'd seen Carrie on stage and I was just like well I don't I didn't know her yeah, I'd yeah. never met her or anything yeah. I'd just seen her on stage and thought she was brilliant um, and uh I was just, I just sort of like, well, I'm going to be up there anyway. It's a time I can do. I'll, I'll tweet this yeah. person back, um, and ended up taking her, her first solo show, which is the one that got her the, the Foster's nomination, yeah, um, and all the, you know, recognition that she deserves. Um, so I ended up, yeah, just taking the show and getting to know her and becoming friends with her, and then that, that, that is the exact moment that's led to me now, taking for an enormous list of. Just amazing, like top of their game, incredible improvisers and improvisers and comedians, um, and why I go back to Edinburgh every year and tech a stupid amount of shows. Yeah, just because I love it. I love I love the people. I love I love seeing the process, um, like, and, and being involved in uh, for some shows in the process of creating these amazing shows, going up to Edinburgh and supporting those shows, whether they're improv or or some other kind of um, uh, comedy. And uh, and just yeah, just I, I I love it. I absolutely love it. I I, I love uh, teching comedy and improv as much as I love performing comedy and improv, um, which is a really nice place to be. Yes. Uh, How do you stay sane in Edinburgh doing all this stuff? I don't think there's any point in uh, trying to give you the impression that I do say stay sane in Edinburgh. Um, <laughs> It's, it can it can be quite a, a roller coaster ride, uh, Edinburgh, but I'm, I am lucky because I'm not because most of the time I do go up and do my own shows as as a performer, um, but m- most of my Edinburgh time is supporting other people's shows, and and in that regard I end up because I'm not I'm I'm not up there to sell I'm not selling myself I'm not out there flyering I'm not uh, for me necessarily there isn't as much of a worry about how many tickets I sell or tickets that show sells um, in terms of the financial side of things which is obviously a really wearing part of Edinburgh I, I do care about ticket sales because I care about the people on stage yeah. so I know that if they have a, a, a smaller audience that it's going to be a harder show for them um, and that distresses me because uh, I do, because I do care about the people that I tech for. I've, I have, I have a hundred percent hit rate in enjoying the company of the people that I uh, am do, I'm teching for an Edinburgh show for. Yeah, I, I've, I've yet to meet and tech for a, uh, an Edinburgh show where I thought the person was an asshole. Right. So, in maybe that, maybe I'm lucky, or maybe just. There are not many arseholes. I'm sure there are a lot of arseholes. <laughs> uh, the thing yeah. is, though, you don't want to annoy the tech. You don't don't annoy the tech. Yes, they've got Buy the lot. tech a drink, guys. <laughs> Espresso martini, please, to keep me awake for the next show. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, and I, but I, I love it. People, people ask me. Uh, there's 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 one question that I get asked quite a lot, which is um, about getting bored of shows. Do you uh, do you get bored of shows? No, I don't. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, and I think this is partly because because I do enjoy the 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 company and the skills of the people that I tech for. But like people like um, uh, Sarah Pascoe is a really interesting one because she is she writes a show almost kind of word for word, 
and she is an incredible performer that she she performs that show unless she's made a conscious decision I think to change a joke or a delivery or something like that uh, her show is almost like like uh, uh, so accurate Tw- you know 25 shows in a row um, and just does it absolutely perfectly to this the, the show that she's written and created and she I mean she's a I'm not a huge fan of stand-up, but Sarah Pascoe is an exception because she's she's so clever. <laughs> she, she, um, uh, she she puts jokes in between jokes, yeah. and I think uh, if you're an audience who's only seen the show one time, that that it's so dense with so dense with uh, uh, information and and jokes and and um, one-liners in between other stuff. It's so dense. I, th- I feel like sometimes you need to see a show more than once to see it all, like everything that it's got. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sarah, yeah, like I say, Sarah is a, an extreme example because she, because she's uh, so clever. But then, then with Sarah's show, I, I could I could take the show twenty times in a row, and on the twentieth performance, I would notice another joke. Yeah. Be like, how have I not seen that? I've got. <laughs> Like I've almost got a script in front of me that I'm following, <laughs> following almost word for word to 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 get make sure my cues are on time and that sort of thing, and uh, and I'm still still noticing yeah. the, like n- these little kind of uh, bits that she's inserted in between other bits. Yeah, she's extraordinary though. I don't I don't know if that's the thing that a lot of stand ups do because I don't I don't take for stand up. Yeah. Stand up doesn't require a technician most of the time because um, it's frequently a person with a microphone yeah that's uh, the standard yeah l- lights go on they talk for an hour then the lights go off um, with a bit of music uh, the, the reason I did ended up teching for Sarah was uh, was a year she did it was a show called Sarah, Sarah Pascoe the Musical oh right uh, and it had a lot uh, within the within what is essentially a stand up routine it had uh, songs with, that some some were her playing guitar and some were live backing tracks and they had to be kind of yeah uh, absolutely spot on in a sentence for it to work. Oh, right, yeah, a yeah. sentence would become a song and then stop being a song and, be, and resume the sentence. She's so clever. <laughs> She's so clever. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so that's that's why I ended up taking her show for a few years. Um, yeah, she was amazing. Um, I forget what I was saying. Oh, it was about getting bored of shows. No, I don't. Be- I think because part of it um, is because I love the people um, and I think they are good. Uh, uh, so that I get I get to see an amazing comedy show every day, uh, or seven or eight, depending on what year of Edinburgh it is. <laughs> but also, but uh, a lot of the people I work with also are looking into the improv part of things as well. So, uh, teching shows like uh, Massive Dad, I think they've all, yeah, I think all all three of them have now uh, delved into the world of improv. Uh, Lazy Susan they all have um, when I'm taking for people like solo shows like uh, Cariad or Rachel um, you know th- these are all people who have improv things so there's, there's this kind of beautiful thing that I get to see when they deviate from uh, what they've scripted or what they've written yeah um, and that's that's just a really fun part for me uh, to, to see them when, when, when they love their show or when they're comfortable with their show so much that they can uh, jump out of the show that they've written yeah. and that, that's just lovely I, I love being there for that I love yeah. seeing that but, you know like, like improv um, uh, that performance is the only time that that gets seen yes. it does happen sometimes in scripted comedy as well yeah. where that perform that performance is the only time that uh, one of the audience members was a four year old child who bought a balloon that blew up that exploded halfway through the show, and that led to yeah. the next ten minutes or whatever. <laughs> um, that, <laughs> that that improv show is the only show where um, a magpie emerged from nowhere and attacked me, the technician. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sort of thing. That did happen in a show in Edinburgh. That happened. In- That's one of my favourite stories about improv. Because some people tell me these things, and I'm like, "Oh, did that really happen?" They went, "No." No, I was attacked by a magpie, attacked during, by a magpie. An, during an ostentatious show. You were heckled. <laughs> yes, the ultimate heckle. Um, <laughs> if, yeah. if, if, if birds are turning on you, <laughs> that is a criticism. So it was a, it was a, um, uh, it was, uh, it was a show at the Counting House where the technic- tech desk was next to the stage at the front of the room, and I was, I sat on the side of the stage watching the show, and towards the end of a show, a show which had included a lot of. Um, uh, 
uh, like game hunting. I think uh, Graham and Andy, I think it was, were two characters who who hunted game throughout the show. So they were they were doing a lot of scenes where they had <laughs> yeah. shotguns shooting birds out of the sky. And in almost the last scene, which was I think it was a wedding uh, between two of the characters. Um, I was watching the watching this scene happen, yeah. and I was just suddenly aware of the entire audience going, <gasps> <laughs> and then a split second later, it, like I didn't know what the fuck was going on, uh, but I was being attacked by a magpie. Wow! Yeah, it was sort of flapping all around. My, I've got a bit of a bird phobia or whatever. Well, if you didn't, um, you do now. Yeah, yeah. So I I leapt from the tech desk onto the stage <laughs> in front of the audience. Um, uh, Which I imagine it, with in kind of situation. sort of slightly hyperventilating, <laughs> um, and then the cellist Carol, um, uh, who is sort of like this, she she does a lot of she she's a, a naturist, is that the right one? She's not naked, a naturalist. Na- yes, she's a naturalist. Um, uh, was able to sort of go and grab the magpie and then took oh. it outside. Uh, and let it and let it free. But this this magpie must have been in the room for like an hour and a half <laughs> before it made itself. No, just sitting behind a curtain or something. Waiting before for it, it decided uh, to the, it decided for the final scene to just like, swoop over the heads of the audience. I'm going to save uh, it. I'm going to save it. I've only got one entrance. I'm going to save it for the big scene yeah. at the end. I'm not going to waste it early yeah, on. Yeah, it had an eye for theatrics. <laughs> Those magpies, they're such... <laughs> Divas. Such, such broad treasures. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was cool. That's one, of my, that's one of my most enjoyable improv stories. The other is when I uh, seduced an MP. Uh, I d- I d- <laughs> I've got to get this in. Um, so... <laughs> Otherwise, 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 the podcast will be over, and I'll be sad not to say. It. So I was, um, it's just, uh, uh, so there's, uh, I was over in Edmonton in Canada doing the fifty hour improvathon performing, um, and uh, it was the the setting of the 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 improvathon was the Canadian general election, which was, you know, a, a few days off happening. This is when you know the, the most recent one when Justin Trudeau was elected. Um, so the setting was the election. I played Donald Trump um, because I didn't know anything about Canadian politics, um, and uh, but I, I I could put a Donald Trump cons- costume together. So I ended up playing Donald Trump for fifty hours. The 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 MP for Edmonton is a this incredible woman called Linda Duncan, and uh, and, and she's the um, the NDP. Uh, MP, she's she's basically like in charge of Edmonton, the city. I mean, she's a, this amazing woman, and she play, she came and played in the show. Uh, she's she's really supportive of the arts and stuff because because uh, uh, they do that in Canada. Um, they well they have Canada. They, well they have politicians that care about that sort of thing um, in charge. Um, so she came and played for a shift. She was in the show for two hours, and uh, so which, which two hours? It was. I don't. I can't remember exactly. It was. A, <laughs> it was around hour forty-ish, I think. Um, and uh, and my my Donald Trump character had become the sort of Lothario, so it had dated quite a few of the other characters. Um, so so Dana Anderson, um, the director, put me as Donald Trump in a bar with Linda Duncan. Um, and uh, I ended up we we, dis- we discovered in the previous uh, episode that I had an illeg- Ill- illegitimate daughter uh, f- from an unknown woman um, so I was like this is perfect uh, so I uh, so I basically uh, said to li- in, in, in the scene I said oh our, our daughter the first, my, the first line of the scene was our daughter's been asking about you um uh, which is probably the line that has got most reaction of anything I've ever done on stage because the audience went fucking mental. Um, because Linda Duncan is also the like the left wing, like really left wing politician. Yeah. Uh, now and now it turned out that Donald Trump and her had, had a child. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we, so we ended up have, like having having this big seduction scene. This Lin, uh, Linda, I'm I don't know how old she is. I'm thinking. She's in her late sixties, early seventies, maybe. Sorry, Linda, if that's wrong. Um, uh, Donald Trump doesn't. So, so we ended up having this big seduction scene that involved that ended with Donald Trump um, going off stage with uh, Linda Duncan, going going backstage with Linda. Wow. But I, yeah, but it was just. But she was amazing. She was just so. She was 
she was so up for everything. She was so enjoying her experience of being thrown onto stage with these uh, idiots who were doing a 50-hour show. So, so what, yeah, is, what, is, what, what is uh, what is your seduction technique <laughs> through the filter of Donald Trump? Obviously, that's they're not the same person. God, I can't remember. It was about hour forty. Oh, um, you know, it's definitely not something I've uh, done in real life. Um, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> or managed in real life. Um, <laughs> you know, just some of our some of the listeners, you know, might like to have a few. Tips. Some dating tips Some from dating Donald tips. Trump. <laughs> uh, I think. I think genuinely, if they, if if Donald Trump was doing dating tips, it would be like assume that they're into you. Uh, make, in fact, make a huge series of assumptions. Uh, <laughs> I've, that got aren't based on facts. I've got people. I've got people that they're telling me you're in them. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Puerto Ricans are really into. They're not Donald. They hate you. You're a terrible racist. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I, main, mainly. I think, and this. Yeah, mainly I think I guess Donald would seduce people by assuming that they're already seduced. Right. Um, yeah, I can't remember the specifics of the scene, but I do remember being <laughs> like, uh, uh, just being, just being like, in, uh, sort of enchanted by this woman who was, you know, she's a high-level MP, but she's absolutely like, no, I'm going to get stuck into this. This is really fun. <laughs> and she, yeah, she was amazing. She was amazing. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds amazing. Yeah, uh, good for her. Cool. Right. So, big finale. Big question. Sure. Big big last question. All right. Um, so, we love improv. Improv is amazing. We do. We love improv. Lights. <laughs> <laughs> we love the technical side of improv. We love it all. Yeah. So. What would you like to see more of in the improv world? If you were made king of improv, uh, I uh, two things I think, um, which are quite connected. One is more variety, I think, and th- that does sound a little bit snide, but I, d- I definitely don't mean it to. Um, it's because um, I'm really excited by a bunch of different types of improv and my life has only ever been improved by discovering the, ne- the, the next new thing yeah. um, and, and, and the, my experience with P-Graph is a really is sort of the, a, a pivotal moment in that where as I went, it was for many people in the London absolutely scene, yes. and quite rightly so because <laughs> like you know it'd be, it might have been a couple of years I suppose before I, I uh, came across them so I I'd, by that time had done uh, short form stuff I'd done Harold stuff I'd done long form stuff and I'd done musical stuff um, and and this and, and and I'd seen a bit of genre stuff because that was at a time when Ostentatious had just started uh, doing you know co- essentially a costume drama improv show so and then I bumped into this group who uh, the first uh, uh, they were doing they were doing a four show uh, circle. They were doing four shows in Edinburgh, but alternating. And the first one I saw, they did a Grim Fairy Tales show, which was just brilliant. And they were so accomplished and so comfortable on stage doing this art form that I hadn't. I don't think at that point, you know, this is seven or eight years ago. I don't think at that point I'd seen a group so comfortable on stage doing this totally unpredictable art form. So I saw them the first night. No- I saw them do the grim fairy tale thing and I was like right I've got to go and, and at the end of the show they were like thanks very much um, we're, we're doing uh, one of our other shows tomorrow and then we're cycling these shows so the next show I saw I went back the next day and saw them do I think the next show was a show that they do called Villainy which is uh, where they play for scares instead of laughs and they right. and they look they really hunt for kind of dark gruesome material in their improv wow. and up until that point all improv had been comedy for yeah. me, uh, and they were really mining stuff that wasn't comedy, which was so unusual. And then I went back the next day, and they did um, a format. I can't remember the name of that format, but it's a, it's a fifties screwball comedy right. thing. And each time they were they they had costumes for that show, and each show was different in in various ways, both in terms of the format and the way that they told stories. Um, and it was it's four people who were so in sync with each other, and that 
and that was really a step change for me because improv stopped improv stopped being just comedy then and became uh, and the and it opened up the options of theatre as well. So I think so. So one of the things I want to see more of is more variety in exploring other things that improv can do. I think we've started doing that in London and they've started doing that in places like, uh, I was in Bristol last week and saw Murder She Didn't Write, oh, yeah. uh, the guys that Brit, which is just just such a good show. Yes. Um, um, and the, so p- I think people are exploring what else improv can do, but I'd like to see more of that because um, that excites me. Uh, and the other thing I, which is sort of related is, um, I'd like to see more, association between the different schools of thought oh, yeah. so we've now got I, I guess four major schools in London school or schools of thought in London Mon- Monkey Toast Free Association Nursery Hoopla and I suppose the, May- the May Days are doing bits and pieces up here as well although they're concentrated in Brighton I'd, I'd like to see more integration I, I think what I'd really love to see is a big improv festival happen in London um, that all of those schools take part in, so that because I, I think there are prob- there are probably students of say Monkey Toast who might not be aware that Hooper exists or might not be aware that uh, uh, you know uh, people in the FA might only see that style of comedy or that style of improv uh, and uh, and maybe missing out on. Uh, narrative improv or something uh, and I think like we all benefit by sharing these ideas yes um, and I, so I'd love to see more yeah more cross pollination I suppose and more encouragement of that by each of the schools I think Steve's very good at that yeah uh, at Hoopla I think he's he's really good at uh, uh, encouraging people to seek out uh new styles and new civilizations, uh, and to boldly go where no improviser has gone before yes. um, yeah uh, but I don't think that's commonplace and I'd like to see more of that I get really excited by by other people's styles styles that doesn't I like going I really like going to see shows that don't get me off as a performer but get me off as a member of the audience oh, right, yeah, yeah. And or, or 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 even shows that don't get me off as a member of the audience, but I can appreciate that um, that they that they've worked on it and that it does appeal to a lot of people and that it is clever. I don't want to I don't want to perform that style, but I want it to yeah. exist. Yeah. Um, because there are lots of people because it's totally subjective <laughs> why, why should every improv show be for me um, if I don't like it that's fine there are 700,000 other people that do yeah um, so yeah I think that's that. I'd like more encouragement of going to seek out other improv being uh, part of it yeah I guess I think those are my two favourite like main things that I'd want really? yeah. also like a couple of improv theatres. Austin's got four improv <laughs> theatres, uh, and it's uh, but own, it's a city of you know only nine hundred thousand people. <laughs> We're a city of eleven million people, and we don't have one permanent improv theatre. And I think that's a shame. Um, uh, talk, when you if you go to IO and talk to the guys that made IO, uh, it was they they say it was the it was the creation of their own space. It was creating of the first improv. IO Improv Theatre that, w- that was the like a switch suddenly yeah. they had their own base they could do what they want they weren't limited by time they weren't limited by licenses they weren't uh, they had their own space to run workshops and shows and rehearsals um, to program every night to do what they wanted to um, yeah and they're doing that at the hideout that, you know all the, all the <laughs> like loads of improv theatres across America with much smaller cities and we are we are a bit behind with that kind of thing. Partly in London due to costs of yeah. uh, of land in London, but uh, we we will get there. There's a lot of people working towards it, and the guys in Bristol have made it happen. Yeah. Um, so we we will get there, but uh, just you know when uh, when when <laughs> when somewhere becomes affordable, one of <laughs> one of us will go. I'm buying it, and then uh, and then make a theatre, and it'll be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Jonathan Funkhouse Monkhouse. Hello. Thank you very much for being on my podcast. Thanks very much for having me. I'm going to go and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> uh, That's all we ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made this. That's improv! <laughs>